Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning, dear friends, and welcome to this module. In the previous modules, we had discussed the genealogical configurations of the term hegemonic masculinities and established the embedded multiplicity of the term masculinity. Today's module focuses on the much debated relationship between feminism and men's and masculinities studies. In this context today, we would look at the work of Chris Beasley. Chris Beasley is the Emerita Professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations, University of Adelaide, Australia. Her research is in the areas of social and political theory, gender and sexuality studies and cultural politics. She tries to explore the relationships between feminism and gender and sexuality studies and the possibilities for dialogue and engagement between them. She identifies masculinity studies as characterized by postmodernist perspectives. Chris Beasley is also known for her critical yet supportive engagement with the work of R. W. Connell, whom we have discussed in the previous modules. Her research interest is also reflected in the title of her books. Moving from what is feminism to gender and sexuality, heterosexuality, she has moved to the cultural politics of contemporary Hollywood films as well as to the issue of internet dating in her 2021 Rootley publication. Chris Beasley is a new voice in men's and masculinities studies. And why do we have to introduce a new voice? It was not until the 1970s when feminist and gay researchers started to theorize the role of men and masculinity in society that an explicit inquiry into men as men and masculinities started on a broader scale. Masculinity studies is today a well-established part of interdisciplinary gender research. In early 2000s, we saw a growing number of masculinity scholars who integrated theoretical insights from contemporary third wave feminism and its post-structuralist and post-colonial and also post-modern influences. Developments in queer and sexuality studies intersections between social categories such as gender, class, ethnicity, race, embodiment, virtuality, technology, streaming services, media, sexuality and age have emerged lately. Therefore, there is an urgent need to welcome new voices who are researching in these emerging fields and also in the field of masculinity and men's studies to promote a sense of equality. This module focuses on an essay by Chris Beasley. The title of the essay is Feminism and Men Oblique Masculinities Scholarship, Connections, Disjunctions and Possibilities. This article has appeared in the 2019 Rutley International Handbook of Masculinity Studies, edited by Lucas Godson, Alf Milstrom, Tamara Schaefer and Grimbeek. Beasley's chapter focuses on the creative possibilities of the disjunctures between feminist and critical masculinities studies, which are clearly embedded in a long historical pedagogy of philosophical engagement with feminist studies, gender and sexuality studies, and now men and masculinity studies, which are popularly known as MM studies. Chris Beasley argues 
that the research on masculinity drives its theoretical developments from feminist theory. Gender occupies a contested position between the material and the symbolic, the natural and the human mate and the nature versus culture diet. Beasley's essay works and reflects upon the relationship between contemporary feminist scholarship and critical men and masculinities scholarship within the discourse of gender and sexuality studies. Though men and masculinities studies is indebted to feminist thinking, it is essential to review possible conjectures and also potential disjunctions between feminist scholarship and the scholarship in the area of men's and masculinities studies. For the present positioning and future directions of men and masculinities studies. Beasley examines the relationship between men and masculinities studies and feminist scholarship to further the course of these studies as a distinct field of inquiry for future research and practices. Her overreaching framework of understanding involves ontological and epistemological considerations. In the first section of her essay, Beasley locates MM studies as one of the three main subfields in the overall gender or sexuality field to indicate connections between men's and masculinity, feminist and sexuality studies. She focuses on the field's potential discontents, indicating possible barriers to dialogue and coalition. It also outlines the differential uptake of postmodernist or post-structuralist theoretical paradigms. MM theorizing continues to demonstrate proximity with feminist, also with sexuality thinking. For Beasley, masculinity studies and feminism are not contradictory fields of inquiry, rather they are intersectional discourses in the 21st century. In its initial emergence, masculinity and men's scholarship is inspired by feminism and it continues to define itself in relation to a feminist sympathetic or more usually an explicitly pro-feminist perspective. In the context of feminist studies having inspired the masculinity scholarship, Beasley has endeavored to view modernism and postmodernism as broad theoretical trajectories located on a continuum rather than binary oppositions. The subfields are not spread entirely equally across this continuum of main theoretical directions. Rather, they tend to clump differently in certain locations across the continuum and more specifically evince a differential uptake of modernist and postmodernist paradigms. Debate about the advantages and limits of postmodern inflected theories like queer theory continues to occupy feminist and sexuality studies. Along with emerging associated debates about new materialism, linking them in terms of theoretical terrain, shared key theorists such as Judith Butler and theoretical debates regarding gender categories and identities. Men's and masculinities scholarship is variously described as being post-structuralist, discursive, material discursive, Foucauldian, postmodern, or third wave in orientation which have developed more postmodernist lines of inquiry. For Beasley, men's and masculinities scholarship follows the postmodern line of inquiry which addresses the dynamic gender spectrum and the altered position of men on this spectrum. The masculine subject can no longer hold the dominant position. The modernist thinkers emphasize on the role of power, hegemonic control and dominance in gender relations. They construct men and women as distinct categories. Whereas we find that the post narrative focuses on the fluidity of gender performance. Many writings within masculinity studies establish a modernist theoretical approach in a social constructionist perspective. Social constructionism is designated label 
for particular groupings of modernist thinkers, including thinkers in the gender sexuality field who have a modernist stress upon power as social structures. And what do we mean by a modernist stress upon power as social structures? That is as macro, foundational, centered and more or less determining and these philosophers are more inclined than postmodern thinkers to view power structures negatively in terms of oppression. Social constructivist writers suggest that identities are formed by the social structuring effects of power. They focus on the social viability of the seemingly homogeneous categories such as men and women. Whereas postmodern thinkers establish the fluidity present in such categories. Beasley does not intend to suggest that it is impossible to draw upon both modernist and postmodernist frames of references. However, this is by no means a straightforward exercise since they are based upon different theoretical assumptions and hence cannot be simply stuck together without explanations. Beasley refers to Cornell's theorization and draws a line of comparison between the feminist and the men's and masculinity scholarship agenda. The two discourses encourage diversity, intersectionality and inclusion of all genders. In the opinion of Beasley, Cornell's work occupies a uniquely privileged position in the subfield. A number of writers in the field of men's and masculinity studies in recent times have offered postmodern and other similar critiques of her work. Noteworthy enough, the agenda of MM studies has changed as it has moved beyond the rubric of gender, a similar stance taken by feminist theorists to inculcate diversity. MM scholarship is still working on theoretical framework, debunking old myths and practices, terminologies and debates to produce a counter narrative to masculinity in its hegemonic construct. Beasley suggests that the process of becoming a man in the 21st century should be understood by both practice and performance while contextualizing the modernist approaches and the postmodernist approaches to MM studies. The I is important and men as a discursive category is equally important to theorize. A modernist social constructivist theoretical stance in the opinion of Beasley is registered in the continuing centrality of a Cornelian approach within the scholarship of men's and masculinities studies. A comparatively limited number of masculinity scholars invoke postmodern theory relative to its uptake in feminist and sexuality subfields. Beasley suggests that it is possible to draw upon both modernist and postmodern frames of references. We can look at certain examples also. We can say that amongst the examples exist understanding a sense of male self on online dating platforms or constructing the meaning of masculinity in the arena of fashion and makeup marginalization of men who do not fit the heteronormative construction of masculinity in both practice and performance. According to Beasley, the construction of the masculine eye and the feminine eye takes place during adolescence and the stereotypes associated with the masculine and feminine self rigidify the practice and performance of both masculinity and femininity categorically. To further this argument, we would look at a video which underscores such stereotypes. How to Raise a Boy is an American week-long series centered around the urgent question of the stereotypes which young boys and girls have to face in an era of Parkland and Me Too movement. In this video, young girls and boys share their thoughts on stereotypes surrounding them. Uh to be a boy. What does it mean to be a boy, in your opinion? To be strong, to not cry. To be tough, um, athletic. To be 
confident and to always keep your head up and be optimistic. It doesn't just mean like you're born a boy, you are a boy. You can switch genders and go to a girl if you're a boy. Being a boy is a lot harder than some people may think. Boys are told to like play sports and be tough. So that's what a lot of people think it means, but I just think it means that you look different than girls do. You may have different hair or different body parts. I don't really know what it means to be a boy besides physical attributes. That's pretty much it. You don't think there's anything else? Like hormones. Girls have different things on their bodies and have um, the advantage of different things like being pregnant. Besides anatomy, what's the number one thing that makes boys and girls different hmm. in your mind? I just think that the way that people think they're supposed to be. Whatever like the stereotype is, you watch sports, you're rough and aggressive and whatever. Girls, they play with dollies and boys, they play rough. A lot of my friends that are girls don't even like dolls. In fact, they're scared of them and they'd rather like play in the dirt. Most boys think girls are all about makeup, dresses, and like sleepover parties and stuff. Some people think uh, girls are just baby making machines that stay at home and um, are just housewives. Like I've seen pictures on the internet of cleaning kits for girls that are they, that aren't sold for boys, like a pink mop that girls can push around. It's very, I don't like it. According to Beasley, gender equivalence advises men and women to help each other in understanding gender on a spectrum and the toxic stereotypes associated with the socio-cultural construction of heteronormative masculinity and femininity. We would also play a video talk by Justin Baldoni. Justin Baldoni is an actor, a humanitarian and activist where he wants to start a dialogue about redefining masculinity. He wants women to help men in redefining the masculine subject. If you're part of the solution, then words are no longer enough. There's a quote that I love that I grew up with from the Baha'i writings. It says that the world of humanity is possessed of two wings, the male and the female. So long as these two wings are not equivalent in strength, the bird will not fly. So women, on behalf of men all over the world who feel similar to me, please forgive us for all the ways that we have not relied on your strength. And now I would like to ask you to formally help us because we cannot do this alone. We are men, we're gonna mess up. We're gonna say the wrong thing, we're gonna be tone deaf, we're more than likely probably going to offend you. But don't lose hope. We're only here because of you. And like you, as men, we need to stand up and become your allies as you fight against pretty much everything. We need your help in celebrating our vulnerability and being patient with us as we make this very, very long journey from our heads to our hearts. And um, finally, to parents. Instead of teaching our children to be brave boys or pretty girls, can we maybe just teach them how to be good humans? So back to my dad. Growing up, yeah, like every boy, I had my fair share of issues. But now I realize that it was even thanks to his sensitivity and emotional intelligence that I'm able to stand here right now talking to you in the first place. The resentment I had for my dad, I now realize had nothing to do with him. It had everything to do with me and my longing to be accepted and to play a role that was never meant for me. So while my dad may have not taught me how to use my hands, he did teach me how to use my heart. And to me, that makes him more of a man than anything. Thank you. These two videos mark the shifts in feminist studies as well as in the area of men's and masculinity studies. They show the coexistence and theoretical exchange of feminist studies and masculinity studies 
in the domain of gender studies. Beasley alludes to Barrett's theorization of the destabilized nature of feminist theories. For Beasley, men's and masculinity theories and studies have to face similar theoretical inconsistencies. However, both reject the self-naturalized status given to gender and to gender performance. To refer to the inconsistency considering the theoretical plane of men's and masculinity studies, Beasley refers to Barrett. Barrett has remarked in destabilizing theory contemporary feminist debates that many feminists have endorsed post-structuralism's rejection of essentialist theoretical categories and have added a powerful gender dimension to contemporary critiques of modernity. Earlier, women have been radically undermined and newer concerns with difference, identity and power have emerged. In this context, Steve Garlick draws our attention to the naturalizing claims about gender. Beasley has referred to Steve Garlick as he exposes the interdependency of the men's and masculinity studies and new materialist ideals. New materialism complicates and expands the discourse of men's and masculinity studies as it denounces the simple categorization of gendered beings and the process of gendering. As a postmodern theorist within the discourse of MM studies, Garlic argues that the theory of hegemonic masculinity needs to be expanded beyond the framework of patriarchy and recast in relation to the place of nature in the complex ecology of human social relations. Beasley notes that the issue here is that the different theoretical trajectories of feminist, sexuality and men's and masculinity studies have shifted in relation to their differential uptake of postmodern perspectives. It has implications for the subfield's account of itself as strongly linked with feminism and implications for dialogue and coalition between the feminist and MM studies. Beasley posits that the second wave of feminist movement was constituted around gender identity. It relied upon the shared experience of oppression. This identity or category politics was initially challenged by those who drew attention to differences within gender categories such as women or women. By the mid-1990s, the associated emphasis on plurality within gender categories had shifted towards a critique of these identity categories under the banner of postmodern inflected analysis. And I quote from Beasley, in relation to gender categories or identities, the well-established antagonism to the presumed limits of gender categories found in sexuality studies is also these days relatively widespread in feminist work, but comparatively is not a marked feature of the MM subfield." Unquote. So, Beasley suggests that gender identities are largely categorized as flat, unidirectional and unexpressive in considering the discourse of men's and masculinities studies. This critique was centered around the second wave of feminist movement. However, men's and masculinity studies are yet to address this flaw and develop a deeper understanding of men as a more fluid conceptualization. The notions of postmodern fluidity challenged adherence to gender categories. Theoretical writings in the field of men's and masculinity studies commonly retain a relatively unqualified and central investment in gender identities. The instance of gender categories or identities can be employed as a concrete means to illustrate what Beasley has described as a disjunction between feminist and men's and masculinity theorizing. In this context, Connell's theorization is indicative. Connell conceives power as a structural, as macro-oppression imposing upon subjects to produce a 
hierarchical pyramid of masculine identity groupings. For Beasley, the process of gendering men should incorporate micro-level assessment, daily patterns of performance, the embedded plurality of the masculine subject and not just the macro understanding of the naturalized category men as heterosocial concept. These masculine group identities such as hegemonic, marginalized and subordinated masculinities are construed in largely homogeneous terms and are typically further homogenized by a reduction to actual groups of men. Connell's account of gendered power is operation that is patriarchy imposes upon the micro level of subjects to produce gendered identities in beings which in turn respond to resist and reconstitute structure. The gendered identities Connell constructs formulate the modernist theorizing on particular modes of being. Postmodern approaches to subjectivity or identity do not focus on being but rather upon subject positions that is placement of subjects in multiple contesting discourses. This refusal of any inner unity to gender identities or subjects, a refusal of notions of being in favor of fluid incohate practices is associated in postmodern thinking with a focus on undoing or troubling gender. Postmodern approaches thus offer substantial challenge to Connell's modernist adherence to structural power and gender categories or identities. For a still deeper understanding, Beasley quotes Bob Peace. Peace suggests that not all men are the same. Similarly, no distinct gender category can exhibit same characteristics. No two women are the same. No two individuals from the LGBTQIA plus community can be the same. Peace suggests a postmodern masculinity politics and observes that not all men are the same and that men is not a homogeneous grouping. Such an emphasis upon the diversity of men does not represent a challenge to gender categories that would be in keeping with postmodern thinking. Rather, simply pluralizing of the category men is associated with the modernist social constructionism and is in keeping with the modernist pluralization of the gender identities, such as the concept of women found in feminist theorizing during the late 1980s and 90s. In reading Beasley's assessment, we may assert that feminism and men's and masculinity scholarship share a close sense of affinity in the 21st century, which was frowned upon in the past. Inter or intra reading is the key to further the men's and masculinity discourse and find new areas of inquiry. In the opinion of Beasley, Peace's work offers a thoughtful engagement with postmodernism. However, she also mentions that much of MM scholarship which attends to postmodern theorizing seems more theoretically underdeveloped. Beasley's concern here is not to suggest that modernist and postmodern theoretical trajectories can never be articulated or that men's and masculinities should necessarily adopt the robust critique of gender categories or identities that is familiar in much contemporary or feminist theorizing. Rather, Beasley aims to raise the issue of dissonance as a matter requiring closer consideration with regard to alliance between the two subfields. In this attempt to bridge the gap between gender and sexuality discourse, feminism and men's and masculinity studies, Beasley's arguments produce some new creative possibilities and insights. Firstly, empathy for the other, that is the masculine other, the queer other and the feminine other. Secondly, initiating a movement towards gender equality and a space for each other in the discourse and the gender spectrum. And thirdly, enlarging the scope of intersectionality between gender and sexuality studies, between men's and masculinity scholarship and feminist studies as there are 
no watertight compartments. Lastly, removing the idea of privilege from the masculine subject and deload its essentialist subjectivities in all fields, including education, healthcare, sports, cinema, media, etc. Men's masculinity and feminist subfields are connected as they fall under the rubric of the gender or sexuality field. However, the heterogeneity may not simply be a gap, but ironically may also provide space for creative possibilities. Such a bridging approach could take two forms, one involving a deliberately contingent use of gender categories differentiated as necessary within particular political practices and the other entailing some use of strategic essentialism regarding group categories such as gender identities. For feminist scholars theoretically, gender identity categories must be unsettled and challenged in practice. The strategic essentialism perspective is seemingly incoherent refusal and simultaneous adoption of gender categories. Beasley suggests that varying use of gender categories becomes more coherent and capable of being considered consistent when strategic essentialism is interpreted as pursuing a view of both theory and practice as bound together through an emphasis on praxis in relation to power. Beasley also notes that while feminist and sexuality studies provide examples of political thinking which advocate on behalf of the marginalized categories that is women and non-heterosexual sexualities, men's and masculinity scholarship does not and should not treat masculinity or men as a privileged category. In a nutshell, paying attention to and rejection of gender categories in theory and practice can express different positionings in relation to power. This perspective, according to Beasley, involves a bridging approach to postmodernist or modernist theoretical paradigms and to the relationship between feminist and masculinist subfields, an approach organized around power and political praxis. It can be said thus that men and masculinities scholarship has self-identified as a pro-feminist approach and may also be located along with feminist and sexuality studies under the auspices of an overarching gender sexuality field on the basis of many shared features. Yet these two subfields have displayed increasingly certain tensions, even divergences signaled by their differential theoretical engagement with postmodernism. Such divergences are evident in their use of gender identities and gender categories. Beasley notes that disjunctions between the differential use of gender categories and identities encourage dialogue and coalition to further the course of feminist and men's and masculinist scholarship. To conclude Beasley's engagement with feminism and men's and masculinity scholarship, we can say that though men's and masculinity studies have a pro-gender approach, a project in constructing theory towards rigorous critical analysis of men and masculinities, it is still requires more interdisciplinary actions to delegitimize the universal, essential and humanistic dominance of men as a subject and as a category. Thank you.